On occasion, I like talking about new or obscure games, despite the lack of attention both games and these videos get. This is such an example. Apocrypha. Oh, oh sorry, that's, uh, that's the Pathfinder Adventure game. This is Apocrypha. I know it's hard to tell them apart because it may come as a surprise. These two games are nearly identical. I stress nearly. As the story goes, Apocrypha was in development first, with the designers creating the Pathfinder Adventure game in the interim. Apocrypha took longer to include additional writing and rules, took a lot longer given its release in 2017, four years after the Pathfinder card game. That offered Apocrypha room to expand, to personalize. And it did. Although the games appear to function identically, I can't use one as an aid to make the other easier to understand. That, and because as you'll probably notice, this video would be an hour long. That said, if you own the Pathfinder Adventure card game, many of the rules I'll be going over will seem familiar. To the rest of you, may God have mercy on your souls. I warned you, but did you listen to me? Oh no, you knew all, didn't you? Am I implying that Apocrypha's manual is hard to understand? Heavens no. I'm implying that the Apocrypha manual is nearly impossible to rely on exclusively, forcing players often to the net to seek clarification on certain rules. Simply put, the manual sucks. Thankfully, like many games nowadays, one can jump online to learn via a handy video. Except the one supplied by Lone Shark Games sucks. It's just the designers playing the game with few instructions to aid consumers. In fact, there are few videos at all across the web, with only one being Rado's exceptional playthrough, which I had to rely on to fill in the gaps. And gaps aplenty there were, leaving it up to me and my demoxidal fueled hyperactive pertinacity. Wait. Pertinacity. Yep, got it right. Moving on. To present a set of rules everyone could hopefully understand. But before we jump into it, I need to admit that I really like this game. It's good. Better than Pathfinder. I may criticize elements, especially its manual design, but when it comes to the game itself, I enjoy it. One of the better narrative story-based games. Well, that being said, let's talk about that story. No, 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 come back. Just give me one minute, just one minute to explain the story, okay? It's got a good story. Just one minute, okay? Okay, I mean, they put a lot of effort into this. It's better than Vanilla Finder. They even wrote an entire second manual dedicated just to the story. No, 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 one minute. I said one minute, one minute, okay? Fine. Imagine our normal world, sheltered by a mystical veil of ignorance known as the paradigm. Fueled by rational thinking and skepticism, this paradigm shields our awareness of the paranormal. Werewolves, vampires, ghosts, smurfs, Believers and other paranormal forces push against this barrier in effort to retake the world and drag it into chaos. And there would be no one to stop them given the paradigm's efforts to keep the population ignorant. But there are certain individuals, seemingly random, cursed to see the world as it truly is, those able to draw back the veil and see the magical machinations occurring beneath the surface. And yes, I know I just paraphrased the premise to Supernatural. And Buffy. And Constantine. Charmed, True Blood, Penny Dreadful, Salem, and the Secret Circle. And Lucifer, American Gods, The Vampire Diaries, Grim, Hex, Sleepy Hollow, Ravenswood, and Bitten. The Magicians, Once Upon a Time, Being Human, The Originals, Angel, Warehouse 13, Fringe, X-Files, okay, we get it. It's not what you would call original. Still, the writers of Apocrypha put in an effort. Oh, and remember when I said I was just going to be a minute? I lied. Set in America in an unspecific time, ignoring geopolitical lines, the nation is divided into regions controlled by the Skinwalkers, the Damned, the Deathless, up in Canada, the Physicians... Wait, Physicians? Okay, going with the flow. A combination of mystical energy and old-fashioned conflict has reinforced their borders, leaving one small region to become a cluster of paranormal energy all factions converge upon. Castle Rock. I, I mean, Candle Point. It's here where those special individuals manifest. The game and its world refer to them as saints. Novel. And
and they are an indiscriminate sort. A corrupt cop, a biker, a necrosurgeon, a burglar, a reporter, and an overweight gambling grandmother. Yeah. They all share a desire to save the day and not get killed doing it. They also share the similar capacity to glean the supernatural from everyday items, to defeat creatures invisible to the outside world, as well as a bizarre lack of memory. Like the quickening in Highlander, the good one, the compulsion to candlepoint and to right the many wrongs of the world may be involuntary, but with hope, as our characters battle their way through this nightmare, they may recover memories of their past lives, preferred over the alternative of encountering visions of one of many possible deaths laying in the future. Stop the creepy music. Thank you. Obviously, this is a card game, so no board. The box offers ample room for expected expansions, stressing expected. The game was released in 2017, and despite the game already including an expansion with the red-bordered skinwalkers, there have been no further releases in this series, and a promised future expansion has yet to materialize as of this video's posting. So that big box may take a while to fill. But with only one row of cards occupied, a handful of ordinary dice, and a fistful of standees, it's shocking uh, the game costs as much as it does, but let's ignore all that and soldier on. If this is your first time playing, you'd whip out the starting deck and build from that. It has everything you need to start a game, but it doesn't cover everything. So we'll skip to the first complete scenario. Setting up a game of Apocrypha is like building one for Legendary, or the aforementioned Pathfinder. You must construct it making each experience unique. Firstly, we need to check out the storybook, flipping past the setting fluff, that map of America, and finally reaching the first of the two campaigns, the Candle Point Missions. We're going to set up taking a plunge, and after reading up on the slightly confusing background, we build the adventure. Most of this can be found on the mission card, except for the structures. Corner the Wendigo along the trail as the hours pass is more than just a strangely worded sentence, but actually details the structure of the story you're going to play out. Draw the structure cards and follow the story. Corner, drawing the corner card, which sets up the win condition. The Wendigo is a threat we'll see in a moment. Along the trail, which dictates how players can move across the board. And finally, as the hours pass, dictating how long players have to finish the game. The mission also details specific rules on how to build the locations, known as nexuses, in this game. Following the instructions, we lay out our four locations from right to left, the lake, the woods, the precinct, and finally, the motel. Only now do I realize I need to reassemble my play area to show everything. One second. The game is focused around the encountering of true threats. And yes, a helpless child is a threat. Ask my fiancé. The less helpless snow angel, bystanders, and finally the main threat, the one we need to defeat for this mission, the Wendigo itself. So with that, we know what must be done for this story. These nexuses possess two sides, the hope side and the doom side. <laughs> By default, doom is face up, necessary since that side also lists how to seed the cards in order to compose the brunt of the adventure. We'll explain the symbology momentarily, but these symbols across the bottom match those with six different decks in the box. Threats, Mind, Body, Soul, Rage, and Omens. To start, take out the deck of Threats. The first location is... Okay, it's blurry, but it asks for three, so three random go face down. Following through with other locations. Next up, in no particular order, as it's not important, Rage Cards. These are gifts, not threats, and we distribute them per the requirements listed on the nexuses. Next up, soul, body, and mind. Finally, we have the omens. Not done yet, the mission stated true threats, but note that true threats are already listed at the top and are double-sided, so instead we employ these minion and master cards to represent them at the locations. The mission states that a master along with minion 1 and 2 are seated in the first three, thus randomized with the four bystander minions number 13 to 16 seated into the last deck. Once we have all the cards distributed, each deck is vigorously shuffled. The first structure indicates that we must destroy the master, in this case the Windigo, also that we can sanctify a location if it or a minion is defeated. Players lose if they run out of omen cards or if the players fade, that is, running out of cards from one's draw deck. 
The second structure states that saints must start left and cannot move right to other locations until the ones they are at are sealed. So this is going to be an all-in-one each location mission, unlike others where players can elect which nexus to start in. And finally, as the hours pass, states we build the time deck out of 24 random moments, which we will do. And finally, the play area will look like this. Well, the communal play area, not including each character area, which will involve another alteration to the play area. I am playing Dr. Z's, the unlicensed necrosurgeon, which I'm sure is a totally upfront and respectable profession. Although it does beg the question, can you be a licensed necrosurgeon? I mean, outside of the Cricks and War Machine? Didn't think I knew that, did you? Regardless, I'm a sucker for a plague mask. Did I mention he's a good guy? Like, seriously, right up there with the cop, the biker, and the overweight grandmother. I get the impression Z's was plucked out of a different story. How odd that in a game about paranormal activity and supernatural monsters, the high roller fits in and the one character that stands out is the necrosurgeon. Moving on. Each character card lists four virtues relating to those cards we just saw. Rage, body, mind, and soul. The arrangement across the perimeter of the card is important, as are the values found in each symbol. Across the bottom displays skill words that may help later in the game, some specific rules, and just under the image two values indicating the number of additional random moments shuffled into one's draw deck, as well as the hand size. If you wanted to, you could even rebuild a character back to baseline using his or her divider card. These are the ones for Dr. Z's. When started, when the game was opened, shuffle your character deck badly, then deal out the starting hand. If you play your cards right, <laughs> funny. Setup can be fast, quicker than even legendary. The play involves a saint adhering religiously to the reference card. There is a lot of terminology and symbols to reference. Loyal watchers, mom, that made it this far into the video it may dismiss Apocrypha as being fiddly or confusing. It can be, but not any more than Magic the Gathering, in my humble opinion, once you learn it. The four virtues are easy enough based on their color and symbology. It's the learning part that can be a tad tricky. Cards will dictate when they can be used and who they can be used against. Arrow pointed down means only you. Pointed up means anyone at your location that isn't you. Pointed both up and down, anyone at that location. Side arrows mean players to your left and right. No, really, the physical players to your left or right. The orientation of players around the game board does matter. Arrows all around, it can affect anyone. If there's a circle, then it includes all saints following those arrows. A star denotes the active player. A star on a box references a saint in the direction where that slotted card is placed, which I'll explain later. <gasps> Have I lost you? Okay, we'll slow down and show you the gifts. The cards in your draw deck, ignoring the omens, will look like this. These are your gifts, divided by their connected skills. Mind, body, soul, and rage. Ignore these values to the right, they only appear when you are trying to attain them. When in your deck, you were, they already belong to you, so these numbers no longer apply. What does apply is the information slug below the image. With the murder board, which is literally just a chunk of wood with nails in it, a magical chunk of wood with nails in it, indicates you and only you can discard it to boost rage. However, below it, this card lists another ability able to help players at your nexus or left or right of you. Recycle the card into the target player's deck for that player to gain one rage die. With this soul gift, you can discard it to boost soul. You can also discard it during the support phase to allow one saint at the table to heal three surge gifts. You can also discard this card during the damage phase to decrease incoming body or soul damage by five. Whoa. Okay, I lost you again. Tell you what, let's make it through this tutorial and I'll show you the clip of the cutest puppy I've ever seen. Deal? Similar to other deck management games, your character fades if they cannot refill their hand. But unlike many of the others, you can constantly move cards to and from your discard deck, which is vital, as when you begin play, you only have 15 cards. Moving cards from your hand is common and a basic function of how the game works. But where the card goes is more important. The game refers to it as cost. The cost of a player playing a card refers to where that card goes. So here they are in the order of helpfulness. To reload means to place a card back on top of your draw deck. To shuffle means to randomly shuffle the card into your deck. Recycling means to place it at the bottom of your deck. These are the good options. 
to discard places it in your discard pile. These cards you may be able to bring back through healing. To bury places it under your character card. You don't lose it, but it is no longer accessible for the rest of the game. You can't even heal it. And finally, to sacrifice means to return the card to the game box. You've lost that card. That's the hierarchy. And this is important as several cards and character abilities allow you to reduce the cost of an item. Dr. Z's reduces the cost of wicked or healing items, which means instead of discarding the scrapbook, it goes to the bottom of his deck as a recycle. When you acquire cards through investigation, these go in your hand. If you heal, you shuffle cards from your discard pile back into your deck. Finally, there's slotting. For that, we need to explain the halo, which refers to the eight positions that surround your character card, returning to what I said earlier. At the beginning, you won't have any cards slotted in your halo, but as play continues through successive games, you'll gain temporary or fleeting fragments that fill these positions, and which can also be sacrificed to eight characters depending on where the card is slotted, the same as the arrow symbols we find on other cards. These also have story points, memories, which develop your character and, and a necessary and appreciated detail. Although initially fleeting, these fragments can be enduring, meaning permanent. And yes, I know, I haven't even explained how the game is played yet. Play proceeds clockwise from the first player, following a turn order with 13 easy steps. Don't wait. Remember, there's a puppy in the near future. Just hold out. When you boil Apocrypha to its basic philosophy, it comes down to these omen cards. Assume these cards equate action tokens. To have one allows you to progress in the game. And even though the clock is made up of omens, there are additional omens to in the Nexus decks and in each player's draw decks. Each player will always have at least one omen on his or her turn, as said turn begins with the drawing of the top card from, from the clock, reducing the clock and bringing closer the end of the game. If you can't draw a card, the game has timed out and the players have all lost. These omens, good or bad, allow players to dive into the Nexus decks. Omens are discarded after the investigation tied to them are resolved, with few exceptions. And often enough, the Doom Omen's negative effect does not activate, likewise with the benefits of a Hope Omen. However, to use the Hope involves flipping the Nexus over to Hope, greatly increasing the positive benefits of the location while that Omen is in effect. However, before diving into one of these decks, the player or players can play support cards to aid the whole, after which the investigation can begin. Assuming a player does not possess an ability to peek before addressing a card, he or she draws the top card from the corresponding Nexus deck. If an omen, the player gains the card and can continue investigating, still applying to the current omen. If another card, a player must confront it. That's right. One must confront Cookies. It's just how you acquire them. I'm sure there's a reason in the rules somehow. Saints utilizing their supernatural talents to glean the paranormal properties embedded in random items. Like a charm bracelet, a scrapbook, or the Necronomicon from Evil Dead hiding within the slipcover or a thinly veiled ripoff of the Dungeons & Dragons Monster Manual. Did I mention I'm a necrosurgeon playing alongside an overweight grandmother? Gaining a card not only allows one's potential lifespan to increase, but it also could come in handy in this or later games. Occasionally, you do have the capacity of avoiding the target. If so, it gets shoveled back into the Nexus, and you draw again. Confronting forces a check, referencing one of the two virtues on the card which connects to the virtues you possess on your saint. If an item, you may acquire it. If a threat, you may attempt to defeat it. If you fail against the gift, it is lost. Fail against the threat and suffer damage, which is the same as discarding cards. Target one of the two virtues you wish to roll against. Select players to assist you. Who can assist you? Well, it depends on where the saints are and where the players are. To your right, you can assist using the right virtue. To your left, the left virtue. Away from you, the saint must be at your location, and when pointed back, you can only assist yourself. Assisting doesn't offer additional dice, rather it offers re-rolls, as many as the assisted ability provides. However, this does mutate the target. Draw a random mutation card, flip to either the threat or gift side. Each player assists you rolls, take the lower value, and suffer the effect indicated. Then you assemble your dice. Man, and I thought I loved using a thesaurus. A number of dice matching the value and color of your saint's virtue are gathered. You can then boost 
any dice already gathered by playing gifts. Additionally, if any of your skill words listed at the bottom of your card match either the target you are confronting or any of the gifts already boosting your roll, you gain additional dice based on the value next to your skill. You only gain four dice of a virtue, after which you gain up to a maximum of four white bonus dice. Although uncommon, you can add dice of another virtue, which you can then also boost. Roll and compare. You can only add up the values of three dice to compare with the goal. So no matter how many you roll, three is all you'll ever get. If a threat and you fail, you suffer damage based on the difference between the roll and the goal. Discard cards equal to that value. Eventually, a saint may be given a chance to sanctify a location. If the saint defeated a master or the nexus is empty, that attempt is automatically successful. If a defeated minion or some other condition allows a sanctify, follow the conditions on the bottom of the nexus. A hope nexus is easier than a doom nexus, obviously. When a location is sanctified, it is considered also sealed. Yeah, I know, the terminology is annoying. The location is removed. Any remaining masters are seated into the open nexuses, and players must all move to a new location. Defeating a true threat is not unlike defeating a regular threat. Those are removed or sacrificed from play, but masters don't. If a master wins, like regular threats, they are shoveled back into the same location. If it loses, it will attempt to escape, meaning it will shuffle into the next available nexus. If a nexus is set to hope and a saint sits in that location, the saint is guarding that location, the master cannot escape there. No place to escape to, the master is defeated. You can also seal the other nexuses, and without any on the board, the master is also defeated. We're almost at the end. The cuteness is coming. As long as you possess omens and are willing to use them, you can continue investigating and diving into the nexus you are located at. When finally finished, and after you have sealed your nexus if possible, you can transfer. This means either moving your saint to another nexus or giving a card to another player at the same location as you. This latter part is critically important as even though some games allow you to play to continue if a saint fades when he or she can no longer draw a card, you are inclined and motivated obviously to keep all the players involved in a cooperative game. It's not like you can keep your extra cards. More on that later. Finally at the end, recycle any extra cards to maintain your hand size, even going below your hand size if you wish, then redraw to ensure your hand size at the end of the turn. Then pass to the next player and the game continues. As stated previously, the last structure card dictates the win-lose condition. If you win, flip your mission card over. That is a fleeting fragment, a random memory a saint may possess, flushing your character's personality. Although random, it does offer some interesting color to your character. Draw a number of additional fragments equal to the number of players and start with the saint that finished the game. Each player drafts one fragment. During the candle point missions, the fragments are fleeting, temporary, as they possess sacrifice abilities that would discard them, thus fleeting. Outside of changing your array of cards, these are the only way to radically improve your character. But considering they are all sacrifice abilities, best hold on to them until needed the most. Unless you have Ophelia, who can reduce the cost of using them. That's... that's a crazy good ability. Wow. I should have mentioned these characters are not equal. Z's reduces the cost of wicked or healing cards, and I have six of those. Fragments are slotted into your halo, those eight slots around your character I mentioned before. Unlike other terms in the game, referring to the ring of cards around your saint as a halo and the group of saints as a choir is inventive. Regardless, the next campaign, Skinwalkers, adds enduring fragments that are not sacrificed. Unfortunately, a character can also die, or rather they gain a vision of their permanent death, and I mean permanent. If a saint cannot refill his or her hand, that character fades. You can still play the game, though reduced given your inability to draw cards, but you will have to gain a death card, or rather a vision of death. These have scripts on them as well. However, this need not mean your death card is permanent. If the mission succeeds, you can sacrifice your just gain fragment to dispose of the death card. If you lose, however, that death card is slotted into your halo, likewise with other characters. If you lost with no saint fading, someone must be chosen. Slot the death, occupying a position in your halo, reducing the number of possible locations of fragments. Not only that, but if death fills every slotted fragment, that saint is killed. Like forever. Like never used in any further games. Ever again. 
This may seem especially punishing, except that the game includes numerous sets to play with. Additionally, if your Halo is filled with death cards, then you don't have any fragments in place, which are the only way to increase your character's abilities between games. No matter how many gifts you acquire during play, at the end you cannot have more than 11, excluding omens, and of a specific breakdown dictated by the numbers on your virtues. Of course, if you're fortunate, you can snag the best card for your character, but 11 is the limit. No more, and no less. Saints can freely trade cards at the end of the game. If less than 11, they fill up from random cards from the box. When you start a game, you can slot your fragments in any position to maximize their effectiveness. And I know, that was a lot. And I think, honestly, you've all deserved this. Apocrypha is not a bad game. I need to state that up front. I keep finding ways to like it. It is a little on the random side, seeding nexuses and the drawing of cards and the rolling of dice, but there are ways to mitigate that randomness. Avoiding threats, gaining omens, I will felt at least partially in control of my fate. One issue that is difficult to understand is how the game manages player count. The game features surprisingly no rules for adjusting the game outside of a single brief mention that if playing with a single saint, you could assist yourself with every check. Of course, with a fixed time clock based on the drawing of omens, it translates to fewer saints possessing more turns in comparison to many saints possessing fewer turns. The issue is that characters are constantly discarding cards in their investigation. Of course, a large chunk of the cards revealed are gifts or omens, which add to your hand, but the number of threats don't change, and fewer saints mean a greater chance for failure to result in discarding cards. Forums have all but confirmed that not only is the game easier with more than two saints, but also that specific saints are far more powerful than others. There's also a bizarre mechanic that allows saints to shortcut large chunks of the game. In the two-player game you see here, you can attempt to seal a nexus if you defeat a minion. If you do so early on, all remaining cards save the master are discarded and the players jump to the next location. On our game, we revealed minions early on, twice, and pushed the master to the last location in less than 30 minutes, and we ended up winning the game with a surprising 13 omens still on the clock. If we had failed against the minions, or if they were deeper in their respective nexuses, said game would have taken a lot longer and potentially been more difficult. The acquisition of additional cards would have extended our characters' lives, but the additional threats might have compromised that. Additionally, character progress is extremely lethargic. The fleeting fragments, though cool, must be sacrificed to gain their benefits. It may not appear the saints are regressing much if their halos are nearly always empty. But it's not until the second campaign that the enduring fragments appear. Sure, you'll eventually be able to ensure that you have the best cards in your deck, but being forced to conform to 11 cards and specific virtues does slow potential character progression. So much so that after several games, you may prefer to swap out characters and stick with a favorite, as focusing on one does not offer a significant advantage. There is one benefit to this in that it allows intermittent players the option to drop in and drop out of a campaign without fear of losing progress, so there is some benefit to that. Now, returning to Pathfinder, it's important to note where Apocrypha differs. For one, Pathfinder employs the standard polyhedron set associated with D&D, while Apocrypha uses a standard six-sided dice. Both games allow players to aid other players, but Apocrypha takes it one step further by allowing rerolls at the cost of mutation. And the turn sequence has also been shifted. In Pathfinder, players can move or trade cards at the beginning of their turns, while in Apocrypha, this occurs at the end, which is a huge shift as it allows players to not only move immediately away from a close location, but also allows players the ability to offer their excess cards to other players rather than be forced to discard them. In Pathfinder, there are abilities allowing one to reveal a card without discarding it, though, and that's one rule missing from Apocrypha. But there's no denying one significant advantage Pathfinder has over Apocrypha. Having been out longer, and having also been an uproarious success for Paizo, there is a lot of its card game to acquire. More than enough to pack that starting box with cards. There is simply way more game with longer staying power and replayability. Apocrypha is unlikely ever to reach that echelon. There's really no way to avoid the elephant in the room. Apocrypha suffers from one of the poorest manual designs in recent memory, further aggravated by a frustratingly obtuse group of designers who created a playthrough video that was equally undecipherable. 
The individual that laid out this book should have been flogged, and the head of the project should hang his head in shame given the absolute embarrassing missteps in writing contained in this book. Rules which are so confounding and hard to decipher that the creator themselves made mistakes in their own videos. And for many of you, that could be the death chant. There are those of you that don't want to hunt down videos or reference forum posts to gain clarification. A manual should be complete and gospel. A bad manual effectively buried First Martians, and Apocrypha appears the next in line to have a candle lit at the Day of the Dead Festival. I mean, its glossary is four pages long. As it stands, Lone Shark has promised several expansions throughout 2018. But as of this posting, they have yet to manifest in any physical sense, with the company having moved already onto other projects. And that's a shame. Once I learned how to play Apocrypha, I came to enjoy it. I adore the fact that it's not an abstract art project or a vanilla fantasy. It doesn't involve surviving a zombie apocalypse or fighting green miniatures across a grid map. And you can play as an old lady with grandkids that probably smells of Lysol and Bengay, if that's at all appealing. I enjoyed Apocrypha, and it upsets me that it, its designers failed in recognizing its potential, like neglecting a promising child. I give Apocrypha a solid 7.5 out of 10, but only because I was doggedly determined to learn the game. And I enjoyed it enough to keep playing. The paradigm may eventually shroud Apocrypha over, burying this game under a veil of ignorance. And that's a shame. I had so much hope, but it may be doomed to obscurity. This is Chris from DS6 Machina. Don't get me started, because we're going to have a laughing fit. <laughs> <laughs> Love you.